Uh, I'll just go over the first two or three slides here real quickly. It's been a couple weeks. We are in our series called Navigating the Narrow Road of Grace and Godly Living. And we've dealt with the principle of uh, liberalism, which takes away from the Word of God. That's their basic era. And uh, little to none, nothing is important to them. Nothing really matters. Uh, they are rebellious. Uh, they have uh, little to no relationship, vibrant relationship with the Lord. And I'm not going to get into all the things that, that deal with that. But we have uh, got moved to the second aspect path that free people can take, and that's the path of legalism. Uh, the difference between religion and Christianity. Religion is do-oriented. What you do matters. Where Christianity is be-oriented. It's what we are. It's what we are becoming. What did John, uh, the Gospel of John says? To them gave he power to what? Become the sons of God. It's in, a, it's in a process of becoming the sons of God. Now John, same writer, said in John 3, Beloved, now are we the sons of God. So how do we correlate um, those two verses? Well, we shared that with you a couple weeks ago, the difference between what I have legally in Christ and what I have experienced in Christ. Two different things. One is a declaration where he declares me to be justified. The other is experiencing that righteousness and godliness that he's already declared me to be. On one side of the coin, Paul says, I am complete in him. On the other side of the coin, he says, pursue godliness and holiness. So we, we have to correlate those two. But you can see here, religion is do oriented. What you do matters. Christianity is be oriented. It's what you are. It's what you and I are. And you know, if we are Christians, we will do Christian stuff, won't we? Amen. Because that's what we are. Amen. But how many know you can do Christian things and not be a Christian? Yeah. Or what would be considered Christian, Christian things? So people can be a, a lot of things and not be that. You know, like an oxymoron. Uh, moron, that's a, 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 a truthful politician. <laughs> All right. Here we go. The path of legalism, the basic error is that they add to, they add to the word of God. And the emphasis is on rules and regulations and guidelines. Uh, depending on the degree of legalism, they're very religious, rigid, and radical. They believe in the reformation of the person that you have the ability to reform yourself. Uh, um, they're self-righteous, which produces a pride in what they do. They behave. Uh, they have a form of godliness. They have religion. They, they have religion without a real relationship. And here everything matters in the smallest detail. This is where, where we get into the legalism. Little to nothing is permissible. The emphasis is on external standards, uh, what we call Phariseeism, although that, that we'll, we'll talk about that tonight when we get to that. The doctrine of the Pharisees we'll, we'll share with you. They count the grace of God as none effect because you have to earn it. And a lot of folks believe that we're saved by grace, but then we're kept by works. And again, I want you to, I want you to notice the difference here because... There, there, it's, it's a difference in motivation. It may not be a difference in outcome, but it's a difference in motivation. And, and that is this. The difference between legalism and walking with Christ and liberty, and we're going to get to that whole subject, is that legalism's motivation is, I have to do something in order to get in good graces with God. I have to do things in order to be holy. I have to do things in order to be in other words, I'm doing something in order to be that. The, the Christianity says, I am, therefore I do. The difference is, I do, therefore I am. They think if they do Christian things, or if they do hold the, uh, according to the law of Moses, then that they're righteous. No, 
we are righteous because God has declared us to be righteous. And what flows from us, folks, is righteousness. But it's not self-righteousness. It's not what we do. It's what Christ does through us. And I hope that you can grasp that difference because the difference, the outcome may not be much different except the motivation is different. It's what is driving us. I'll, I'll try to flesh this out a, a, a little bit, a little bit more. All right, Galatians. Now, why don't you turn to Galatians, the first chapter, and you'll see in verse 2, he says, And all the brethren, he said, Paul the apostle, not of men, neither by men, but by Jesus Christ uh, and God the Father, who raised him from the dead, and all the brethren which are with me unto the churches of Galatia. <coughs> there were many churches of Galatia. But then skip down there to verse 6 is where he begins to, after his salutation, begins to jump right in to an issue and a problem that the church of Galatia had. And he says this in verse 6, I marvel, I'm shocked, I'm surprised, it's taken me back. Now listen to this, that you are so, what's that word there? Soon. Soon. This has happened to you in a very short order. It's, it, he says, I am, I am shocked, I'm taken back, I, that I marvel that you're so soon, what's this word here? Removed. Removed. From what? I'm shocked, church, that you're so soon removed. From what? Grace. From him that called you into his, to the grace of Christ. <laughs> You've removed yourself from the grace that is in Jesus Christ. To what? Another gospel. Another gospel. Not the right kind of gospel, but another gospel. And uh, you, can, you can see this, this whole aspect here of Galatians 6 through 10. He says, which is not another, says it's really not a gospel, but there, there be some that trouble you and would, verse 7, pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As I said before, so say I now again. He's repeating himself. If any man preach any other gospel unto you than that which you have received, let him be accursed. For do I now persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I yet please men, I should not be the what? The servant of Christ. So he's, he's talking about things here. Um, and let me just say, laws don't change people. Did you know there's a million laws on the books for every, every person alive here? A million laws. There's no way we can get We're violating something. Laws don't restrict people, do they? No. Laws don't keep people intact. In That's why the Ten Commandments was good. It was very good. It was right. It was straight from the hand of God and from the heart of God. But see, laws only restrict outward conduct or attempt to restrict outward conduct. It doesn't change anybody. That's why in the Old Testament you'll find the prophets say God's real intent was to write his law on their hearts. hearts. So that it came from the inside to the outside. That the inside would be changed by the words and the law of God converting the soul. And that they would, it would manifest itself in what they did. So laws don't restrict anybody. Uh, they, they only, I mean, they, they don't change people is what I mean. It only restricts outward conduct. And uh, I will tell you, the flesh loves to be religious. How many religions are in the world? The flesh loves to be religious. It appeals to the sight walk. It appeals to the sight walk. Now, here's the thing. He says, this is another gospel. And what was this other gospel he was talking about? Well, here's, here's what they did. <coughs> they... They embraced Christ, and then they added the law of Moses. They embraced Christ, 
And then they added the law of Moses. I'm going to share with you that the law of Moses included more than just the Ten Commandments. <coughs> and there were two, two aspects of the law. We'll get into that in just a few moments. But he says, you pervert the grace of God. That's pretty strong language, isn't it? Right. You're perverting the grace of God because it's works and human effort that is added to the, gra <coughs> to the grace of God which in reality perverts the grace of God. What is the grace of God? <coughs> Simply put, it's unmerited favor. We didn't deserve it. We didn't earn it. It's given freely. Look, folks, here's the bottom line. When you and I get to heaven, the Bible says we're going to cast our crowns at his feet, saying you deserve all the glory, honor, and power, right? Because it's not in us. We, you and me, cannot do anything to merit the grace of God. There's nothing that you and I can do that will make us holy. There's, did you hear what I said? There's nothing you and I can do that will make us holy and godly. It is only the work of the Holy Ghost in the life of the believer that makes a person holy. So let's talk a little bit about this. <coughs> right. What is the error of legalism? It is the belief that a person can be righteous, holy, godly, and please God by obeying laws, rules, and regulations. It is measuring spirituality by a list of do's and don'ts. It judges primarily by outward appearance rather than inward character. What did Martin Luther King Jr. say? It's not the color of the skin that should determine a person, but the what? Content of his character. Because none of us here tonight got to choose the color of our skin. None of us. I, I don't understand prejudice and bias. I don't, I don't understand it in, in the least. Because none of us get to choose. I didn't get to choose to be white. You didn't get to choose to be what color? You, you know, it's just what we are. And Jesus wasn't white. He was olive skinned. He was Jewish. So, you know, none of us got to choose that. But here's what Mar but Martin Luther King Jr. had a, a truth when he says, you know, we don't judge things by the, the outward appearance of things. You judge it on the content of character. But see, the legalist judges his own the outward appearance rather than inward character. Holiness is achieved by attaining high standards of conduct. It is usually hard, critical, unloving, and unforgiving. It is of the flesh, which produces a pride in self for appearing unto men righteous. Now, I want you to get a few points here because I want to stress these. First of all, that person can be righteous, godly, and holy, and please God by obeying laws, rules, and regulations. Secondly, they measure spirituality by a list of do's and don'ts. It judges primarily on outward appearance rather than inward character. And holiness achieved is achieved by attaining high standards of conduct. The problem is it's hard, critical, unloving, and unforgiving. Here's what C.H. McIntosh wrote 100 years ago. He wrote these words. There is no evil or error more abominable in the sight of the Lord than legalism. Because it's, self, it's, it's an attempt by self to make self righteous and holy and godly. So here, those are the things that we, uh, we have to do. I want you to turn to Galatians. Um, well, let me just say, first of all, legalism is, is striving to please men. And this is what Paul said in the first chapter. He says, do I now please men or God? Now, he's going somewhere with this because in the second chapter, he gives an illustration and an example. Legalism is an attempt to please men. It's not an attempt to please God because God sees through all the mess. He knows our heart. He says, do I seek to please men? For if I yet please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. If I'm trying to please men, then I'm not going to be the servant of Jesus Christ. It is a human endeavor 
that accompanies a sincere faith in order to be saved. And sometimes this is legal, some leaders are very, very sincere in what they think and how they live. It is an attitude that God will love you more if you do certain things. You ever heard that? I have. That if you do certain things, God will love you more and honor you more. Folks, the Bible tells me while we were yet sinners, Christ loved us. He can't love us any more than he does right now, and he can't love us any less. He doesn't love the world any less. Nope. It's a gigantic attempt of the flesh to deal with sin. That as long as I crank up my willpower and I do certain things, I can deal with sin. So you've got much religion. Sometimes, many times it's sincere, but it is self-righteous. And it produces a hypocrisy. So let me just touch base with you on this. When, when, you, look at, um, when, you, when you look at Galatians, the second chapter, verses 11 through 14... The Apostle Paul speaks of an encounter with the Apostle Peter. Now, the Apostle Peter, you know he had that vision that says what God declares clean, don't you call unclean. Remember that? All right. Well, the Apostle Peter would sit down with, when there were Jews or when there were Gentiles around, he'd sit down and eat with them and he'd eat, you know, he'd eat whatever he wanted to. <clears throat> but then when the Judaizers came on the scene, in this particular case... The Apostle Peter separated himself and only ate with the Jews who had been circumcised and not the Gentiles who hadn't. And the Apostle Paul confronted the Apostle Peter to his face and basically said, you're a hypocrite. Mm -hmm. Says when they're not around, you eat with those folks, but when they're around, you separate yourself and eat with those folks. And you're being a hypocrite. And so what he was saying is that he, you, you separate yourself from other believers you don't think are abiding by all the rules and regulations when those people are there. And here's the problem with legalism, because it, it is an attempt to please man. It's an attempt by other people to conform you into something that they think is right. I'll share some personal stories, but see, I, I, I remember... Yeah. I'll come back to it. I'll come back to it. I will. Uh, so they believe that they're justified by the works of the law. Here's the thing. It's a fig leaf religion. It's a fig leaf religion where we attempt by man to cover his own sin by his own methods and work rather than by faith in the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Folks, let me just, and again, I want to clarify. Whatever life that I live, I live by the grace of Jesus Christ in my life. And each one of us are on our journey into God. We have not arrived yet. There's no mountain of holiness that we climb and place our flag there and say, yeah, I've arrived. Because that just doesn't happen with any of us. It is a lifelong pursuit of pursuing Jesus Christ to be more and more like him. And regardless of how long we live, we will never attain that which we have been attained for. In other words, we're never going to arrive to that high calling in Christ Jesus until Christ comes back again. And then we shall be like him. God will complete the work. Until that day, every one of us are on our journey into God. Amen. And we're endeavoring to be more and more like him. But my point here tonight is this. It will only be by the grace of God. Whatever kind of life or lifestyle that I live as a result of my relationship with Jesus Christ, all goes back to the grace that he has given me. And, you, you know, James put it this way. He said, in many things, we all offend. Nobody's exempt. In many things, we all offend. That's because we're all still on our journey. We haven't arrived yet. We've got a long way to go to be like our Lord. 
We have a long way to go to allow the fruit of the Spirit to be active and alive in our lives. So at the end of the day, it is only by the grace of Jesus Christ that we are saved. All other methods is a fig leaf religion. It's an attempt to make ourselves conform to the image of Jesus Christ by our own attempts. It's an attempt to cover up our, our own condition and our own sin uh, and standing by our own methods. It, uh, it, look, folks, it took the shedding of blood to forgive us of our sins. Amen. And it was the precious blood of Jesus Christ. You know, it's the, it's the offering of Cain where you go to God on your own terms and in your own way. I am sure, now a lot of folks says, well, it was Cain's attitude that was the primary problem and not, not the fruit of the ground. I'm not so sure because the Lord established what it took to cover themselves and that was the shedding of an innocent animal to cover them, not their own fig leaf religion. And so not only was Cain's attitude wrong, but he wanted to come to God by his own terms and by his own work and effort. You see, when you, when you sacrifice a lamb, you may be the caretaker, but you don't give life to that lamb. You weren't the creator. You may be a caretaker. So, you know, here's, here, here's the issue of Cain. That, that man could actually make himself holy before God by his own actions and standards uh, and conduct. And, um, you know, a, a legalist have a lot of standards that it follow provides God in this homeless. Let me, let me ask you a question. Some misconceptions here and false thinking concerning legalism. And I want to ask a rhetorical question, not asking for a response. The problem is, is that is morality holiness? You see, we're living in such a day now that if you are moral, you're conservative. And generally, we are, we're Christian-oriented, but people could have a moral life and not be Christian. They just crank up their willpower and say, this is the kind of life I want to live. You know, I, I heard Trump say, I taught my children not to drink, not to smoke. That's what I taught them, not to do drugs. And they don't. So people can restrict behavior, right? They can restrict their behavior. But that doesn't make them holy. Being moral is not godliness. <coughs> Being moral <coughs> is not spirituality. I think it can be misconstrued mis uh, today that if you're moral that you just might be spiritual. But it's not. You can't be spiritual without the Holy Spirit actively working in your life. The second mis misconception is that conservative standards and a lifestyle is holiness. Did you notice the word here? Is holiness. Let me ask you a question. Is there any standard or rule or regulation that can actually make a person holy? Is there any rule or regulation or standard that can actually make a person holy? Absolutely not. For many, many years, uh, I, we, you know, there, there, are, there are several organizations that are called holiness organizations or holiness denominations. And I think one of the fallacies in, in that thinking is that we use the term holiness standard. And I, I, I don't believe there's such a thing. That there's a standard that in and of itself is holy. Now again, it comes back to religion versus Christianity. People can have standards. I was... I shared with you, I was sitting at a table with a group of ministers, and uh, 
uh, we were talking about, uh, they were talking about holding a standard. I said, well, the problem is, is that we confuse the two terms. We say, we don't say standards without saying holiness. We don't say holiness without saying standards. And I said, we think they're the same thing, and they're not. It took me about 10 minutes to systematically t take them to a point where they actually agreed with that. It took a while to get there. I said, if standards were in itself holy, then Muslim women would be considered really holy because all you see is the whites of their eyes. But how can they be holy if they don't know Jesus Christ? So it's a misnomer and it's a false presentation to say that there's any standard that in and of itself is holy or godly. So you can have religion and do things that appear unto men righteous. Now, let me get to the flip side of that so nobody misunderstands what I'm saying. Like I said, there's, there's a difference in motivation. Right. But if I love the Lord and I have an ongoing relationship with Jesus Christ, Jesus said this, I do always those things that please my Father. Right? Because right. he was led by the Spirit. And if you and I are a Christian, we're going to live in such a way that not only is our heart and our spirit in tune with the Lord, but what people see on the outside will also bring glory and honor to Jesus Christ. Amen. What do I mean? It'll, you know, a living, vibrant relationship with Jesus Christ will affect your talk. It'll affect your look, your appearance, what you wear, where you go on vacations. What? Your attitude, what jokes you laugh at. Hello. Amen. So if I am a Christian, it will affect my lifestyle. But I don't look at my in the mirror and look at my lifestyle and say, boy, I'm holy. Because I've got a long way to go to be like my Lord. I have a long way to go to reach that righteousness that he has imparted to me and live it out. You see the difference here? <clears throat> Legalism is a miserable lifestyle. It's always trying to perfect oneself by self-efforts and rule keeping. You see, people are bound by, by legalism and they're miserable. And uh, you, you remember, uh, uh, it's a powerful book. And they've made a couple films out. Les Miserables. It's an interesting, it's a really interesting book and story about a, a law officer who was so bound to the rules of keeping rules and a, and a former criminal who went to jail for stealing bread because he was starving. And when he was let out, or he escaped later, this, this law officer hounded him for 20 or 30 years. And the guy who, uh, who escaped had built a good business and made a lot of money and he was always helping. And, and he, he basically forgave this guy who was always hounding him. And the end of that story, it's an amazing thing. I, when, I, when I first saw that, uh, it, it just made such an impact on me because this law officer, rather than forgive and give mercy to this man at the end, couldn't take it. He was so rule-bound that he just threw himself in the river and committed suicide rather than break one of his precious rules. That's legalism to its height. Right? So, here's what we have here. Chuck Carlson, or Charles Colson, Loving God, writes, and I think this is a very interesting statement. He says, seeing holiness as rule-keeping breeds serious problems. First, it limits the scope of true biblical holiness. Because rule-keeping holiness is bound by the rules. And the rules can't cover everything. I remember in our organization, you know, before computers, you know, we were against certain technology. So we were getting it. We just get it. Then when computers came out, 
boy, that was pretty hard for us to be really consistent. And this is what happens because society changes that you just have to keep adding to the list and list and list and list and list. So he says, first of all, it limits the scope of true biblical wholeness, which must affect every aspect of our lives. True biblical holiness affects our whole life. Mm -hmm. Second, even though the rules may be biblically based, we often end up obeying rules rather than obeying God. Concern with the letter of the law can cause us to lose its spirit. Third, emphasis on rule keeping deludes us into thinking we can only be holy through our own efforts. Do you hear this? Yeah. Emphasis on rule keeping deludes us into thinking we can only be holy through our own efforts. But there can be no holiness apart from the work of the Holy Spirit. For it is grace that causes us to even want to be holy. And everyone say amen. Amen. And here's these, what he says. And finally, our pious efforts can become ego gratifying. As if holy living were some uh, uh, some form of a spiritual beauty contest. I like that. <laughs> Such self-centered spirituality in turn leads to self-righteousness, which the very the very opposite of selflessness and true holiness. You see, rules holiness is never inclusive enough. You know, when I was growing up in church, it was interesting. If it was fun, we were against it. <laughs> if it was fun, we were against it. And I, I, re I remember, oh, some of the nitpicky stuff, you know. Now, you know, coming from the South, we always wore long sleeves. All you northerners were all lost because you wore short sleeves. And, uh, <clears throat> you, know, that, and, and, and uh, you know, some people talk about conservatives. I said, you don't know. If you've never been down south in its heyday, <laughs> you don't know what conservative is. <laughs> um, couldn't wear your shoes, heels, uh, higher than a certain. Uh, look, I, I, I remember when Double Knit first came out for men's clothes. I was in Bible college. Had people say, well, you know, that's women's clothes. That's women's material. Pretty soon you couldn't got, you couldn't buy, nobody could buy anything. They didn't have some form of nut double knit in it. And I, I remember when I was in Bible college, that's when flares came out for the men's suits. And we had guys in, in college that just say, I just preach against those flares. And then somebody asked me what I'd do. I said, well, I'm going to wear what I got until I need something. And I'm going to go to the store and buy it. Because there came a point where you couldn't get a pair of pants that didn't have a little flare in it. And some of these guys who held to their rule and regulation were going down paying a lot of money to get the flare taken out of their pants. And uh, <clears throat> then you couldn't wear colored shirts. And uh, women couldn't wear red dresses. And that was the color of a harlot. And I said, it's also coloring your blood when it hits air. I mean, you know, what do you want? Uh, and, and just on and on and on and on, you know, you just, everything that, that even appeared to be fun was wrong and sinful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I mean, just so, so many things that people got caught up with and, and, and they, you know, they would say, well, these, these are holiness standards. No, they're not. They may be standards, but that has nothing to do with holiness unless the heart is holy. Unless there's a growing relationship with Jesus Christ. None of those things do anything for anybody except make themselves righteous. And we're going to get into that. I know I can't cover everything tonight. And I don't want anybody to misunderstand. <clears throat> I don't want anybody to misunderstand what, I, what I'm saying here. Um, the question that needs to be asked, uh, asked leaders, is there such a thing as a standard of holiness? Thereby I'm making a person holy. Can any standard of conduct actually make a person holier? Absolutely not. And I think in our own movement, 
And I've had to work them because I was raised a certain way. And it was a, it was a hard thing for me to start processing it. And to think about it as, as the Lord would, would think about it. Because holiness was, was denigrated to a list of do's and don'ts. Which had absolutely nothing to do with holiness unless the heart was holy and you did what you did to please God. Amen. You look back through history, I mean, Coke was wrong, coffee was wrong. I always told people I was sanctified. <laughs> and I don't drink coffee anyway. But you know, I've been places where, you know, everything, it didn't matter. Certain foods are restricted. Certain activities are restricted. All, all in the name of holiness or godliness. And the point is, is that there is no standard, there's no conduct that you and I can do that will make us holy or holier. I will tell you what will make you holy, and it will affect every area of your life, is when we walk in the Spirit, we will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. It is the power of the Holy Ghost that brings us into to this. I came across this story. It's a, it's a book by Chuck Rind, uh, Swindoll who, uh, entitled Grace Awakening. Um, and here's a story he shares in one of his chapters. He says, several months ago, I was, con I was conversing with a man I greatly admire. He is a Christian leader in a position that carries with it heavy and extensive responsibilities. He said he was grieved on behalf of a missionary family he and his wife had known for years. The legalism they had encountered again and again on the mission field from fellow missionaries was so petty, so unbelievably small-minded, that they returned to the States and no longer planned to remain as career missionaries. He said it was over a jar of peanut butter. I thought he was joking. To which he responded, no, it's no joke at all. I could hardly believe the story. The particular place that they were sent to serve the Lord did not have access to peanut butter. This particular family happened to enjoy peanut butter a great deal. Rather creatively, they made arrangements with some friends in the States to send them peanut butter every now and then so they could enjoy it with their meals. The problem is they didn't know the other missionaries considered it a mark of spirituality that you not have peanut butter with your meals. I suppose the line went something like this. We believe since we can't get peanut butter here, we should give it up for the cause of Jesus Christ or some such nonsense. A basis of spirituality was bearing the cross of living without peanut butter. The young family didn't buy into that line of thinking at all. Their family kept getting regular shipments of peanut butter. They didn't flaunt it. They just enjoyed it in the privacy of their home. Pressure began to intensify. You would expect adult missionaries to be big enough to let others eat what they pleased. Right? Wrong. The legalism was so petty. The pressure got so intense. And the exclusive treatment became so unfair. It finished them off spiritually. They finally had had enough. Unable to continue against the mounting pressure, they packed it in and were soon homeward bound disillusioned and probably a bit cynical. What we have here is a classical modern-day example of a group of squint-eyed legalists spying out and attacking another's liberty. Not even missionaries are exempt. Would you please give up your list of do's and don'ts for everybody else? Just keep them for yourself. If you're not into peanut butter, that's fine. In fact, you have every right to take your hands off. If that's, not, if that's your thing, you shouldn't eat it. But don't tell me or someone else we can't enjoy it. And don't judge us because we do. I've seen things less than peanut butter. Color your sock, how high your pant was. I always said, you know, look, it's heaven, 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 <laughs> I said, give me and tell me one one sixteenth inch between this line and this line is the difference between heaven and hell. <laughs> when I was a, when I was a young man in the ministry, I always wore my hair fairly full. It touched the top of my ears. 
I did not have white sidewalls. I never liked white sidewalls where you could see them. That's what white sidewalls are when you cut them right up here and it's all white above your ears. That's what white sidewalls are. I think I needed to explain that. <laughs> but I always wore my hair fairly. Fair. Talk about criticism. And when I was in, when I was in high school, well, I, I, I know I've shared this story before. In, in friendship, when I was in, a teenager in friendship, we changed pastors every year whether we needed to or not. It just happened. I think I was there six or seven years, and we had seven pastors. And each one brought their own idea and thinking. Well, the last pastor we had that was there, um, and he was there a couple of years, <clears throat> um, didn't believe in any kind of rings whatsoever. Not wedding rings, no kind of rings, nothing. Well, before he got there in my junior year, I had ordered my class ring. And about the time he got there, I got my class ring. And he told me if I was going to do anything in that church, I couldn't wear that class ring. I paid a lot of money for it. That was back in the late 60s. It cost a lot of money. Now, I could have said to him, you know the previous six pastors we've had here since I've been here? <laughs> Never once required that. I didn't do that. I was obedient. I took it off, put it in the drawer, it stayed there until I let Jared play with it one time and it was gone. <laughs> it's probably worth quite a few hundred dollars today because of the gold in it. <clears throat> and, uh, you, you know, there was it, it, so many things. Little, little thing. And so things can change with people's understanding and, and, and whatever. But I, I just want you to know that standards in and of themselves do not make anybody holy. It's what's in the heart. It's being led by the Holy Ghost. It's being led by the Spirit that conforms us little by little into the image of Jesus Christ. That's what makes us holy. Right. It's not a list of do's and don'ts. In fact, fences are for the young. And I will tell you there were boundaries. I'm not going to sit here and tell you there's not boundaries. Israel didn't have free course over all the land. Israel had boundaries. Amen. And there are boundaries in the Christian life. But none of those boundaries, none of the boundaries that you have, will make somebody holy or godly or righteous. Amen. It's only a work of God's Spirit in our lives. It's a work of the Holy Ghost in our in our lives. Well, let me close with a couple things here. Martin Luther said, there's something about man that he is even more afraid of grace than he is of the law. And you know why? He doesn't explain it here, but I think what he means is that the law, I have the list. I know where I know where everything is, but grace doesn't deal with the list, it deals with the heart. It deals with the Spirit. He said he is wary lest receiving the goodness of God should result in careless, sinful living. People say, well, if you don't take, if you do not do this, that, and the other, you don't preach about this, that, people will just be careless. Look, I lived in an organization that preached it all my life, and people still do it. They still violate it all. I had one person tell me one day, one day <laughs> this is years ago, Came out of a Bible study, I'll close with it. Came out of a Bible study and told me I'm going back to a church that God had brought him from. I said, well, I'm shocked. Well, why? I said, you're going to go back to the church God brought you for out of? Well, I'll tell you, there's people in that, people in that room not living according to the Bible. I said, I'm sure there are. What they wanted, they want me to do something about it. We had a little conversation going on. I said, well, what do you want me to do with them? Well, I did. I said, no, I'm just asking you a question. What do you want me to do with them? Do you want me to kick them out? Well, well no, no. I said, well, then what do you want me to do with them? 
I went on to say to them, I said, they stood under the ministry of Brother the Pastor Paul Carney for 28 years. If they didn't get it then, they sure not going to get it from me. If they, did, if they didn't capture it then, there's nothing I'm going to say that's going to change their mind. This is the only time this person ever came back and admitted they were probably wrong in their life. <laughs> they came back to me the next week and said, well, you were right. I said, yes, I know. <laughs> what do you want me to do? Kick them out? You want me to stand, stand at the door like I've heard some ministers say? There are certain people that are dressed certain ways. We don't let come into this church. I said, how tragic. Because the Bible says, all come. Go on the highways and byways and compel them to come in. Don't take no for an answer. You see, what a legalist does says you have to measure up first before we will accept you and receive you. Well, come back next week. I'm going to talk about a day in the life of a legalist. Okay? Thank you, Lord, for this day. Thank you for your mercy and your grace. Your grace has been abundant in our lives. Lord, we would not even be here tonight.